For reasons that we still do not know, dinosaurs, unlike many other groups, played with the water, but never really adapted themselves for a life in the water, as predators of fish, for example, until Spinosaurus. We're here in the fossil lab at the University of Chicago, where we have the bones of Spinosaurus, and it's named after its long spines, uh, dorsal spines that formed a big sail over the back. Uh, these spines, uh, here's a piece of one of them, stretch up for as much as seven feet making it the, the tallest structure of any dinosaur in the world over its back. We took a section of the femur to look at the details of how old the dinosaur was and what the structure was, and we found that it didn't have a marrow cavity. Now, we had never seen this in any predatory dinosaur. They all have good marrow cavities, but not Spinosaurus. And that resembles animals that actually are spending a lot of time in water. They want themselves to be a little bit heavier so they don't float all the time and they can control their swimming movements. This thigh bone is shorter than this shin bone by several inches. The shin bone is long in animals that paddle, in animals that are sitting on the top of the water and using their limbs to paddle. That thigh bone becomes short and stocky. And we notice the, the attachment on the thigh bone for the muscle that moves it back is huge. So what we're looking at is an animal that has adapted its, its hind limb largely for paddling in water. So that was one of the first things that we realized about this dinosaur. It was not a typical land dinosaur with really strong and long limbs for walking. In fact, by the time we took this thigh bone and attached all the bones together and made a digital model, it couldn't stand on two feet. It really needed its forelimbs to prop itself. It does top T-Rex as the longest predator. T-Rex, just over 40 feet. Spinosaurus, 50 feet long. You know, the Spinosaurus story is, is truly unique. It's an international story of, of scientists getting together and that it stretches across a century. The first bones were found by a German scientist, Ernst Stromer, in Egypt in the Western Desert. Those bones, which he beautifully described, they were destroyed in World War II. And we've been living with more or less a shadow of this dinosaur all of my life as a scientist, a century would pass before on a desolate cliffside in Morocco, a nomad would uncover the bones of the feet stick of this dinosaur sticking out. And he would dig those up and those bones would be taken back to an oasis nearby where I have worked and other people have worked in the Sahara. Uh, we've worked along this cliff line. That was one that escaped us. And those bones would be sold and taken into the fossil market. They would show up later in the basement of a museum in Milan, where Nizar Ibrahim, a paleontologist working here at the University of Chicago, would recognize them as the very bones he saw in a shop in Morocco. He would go back to Morocco, find the fossil dealer who would ultimately take us back to the original site. Now that is a first for paleontology. We've never relocated a celebrated fossil that was taken out of the ground years before. We went back, found more bones of the animal, brought them all to Chicago to be scanned and incorporated into the first truly accurate digital model built on all these different specimens. Putting Stromer's observations in this historical light, he was right about almost everything he said about this dinosaur from his specimens. And he is going to be the, the historical hero of our story. But it's something more than that. For Morocco, this specimen is going back home. For Morocco and the future, this is going to jumpstart a museum tradition in the country. They have a celebrated centerpiece, Spinosaurus, to build around. And that is a very happy ending to a scientific story.